Artbeat FM and welcome to His Art every Friday between 8 and 10. And this morning I want to talk to you about identity. And this is not identity theft or identity fraud, but it is about your identity, the way you see yourself. Now if I think of my youth and my childhood, many of you have heard my testimony. I can think of a time where I was very unsure of who I was, trying to prove myself trying to make other people see who I was. So I had an identity crisis. I didn't know who I was. And if you've ever met somebody who's totally insecure and who was hurt by life, you will understand that hurting people hurt others. And when we look at society and the mental health epidemic, we see that lack of identity and clarity causes insecurity, it causes inferiority, and these two, insecurity and inferiority, are the primary causes of what we call human delinquency. It's negative, adverse behavior in hum human beings, and especially in children. Like my behavior was abrupt, and people said, no, you have a problem. I know they wanted to put me in reformatory at some stage. People were saying, I've got a problem. I'm a problem child. But it was because I was unsure. I was insecure. I was hurt. And it was just escalating because every time my behaviors would get worse, my environment would get worse, and it would reinforce my delinquency. And I would start really becoming aggressive and agitated towards life. Eventually, it ended up being painful because I ended up sitting at home thinking about my life and I got kicked out of school, I got kicked out of army, I never finished anything, I never achieved anything, I was unsuccessful and I lost my total identity, I thought I was a failure, I was a loser, many of my teachers and those who were supposed to teach me were telling me, you're going to end up in prison, you're a loser, you're nothing, you're worthless and that made me angry against life and I took that out on other people, I used to fight, get into fights I wanted to kill people. If somebody just looked at me, I was so angry, I would try and beat them up. I remember hitting somebody with a stick over the head once. It, all my responses were totally elevated. And if you look at society today and you look at identity, if you consider delinquent behavior, whether it is dishonesty, people are dishonest, duplicity, People are two-faced, even in the church. People are talking behind each other's backs. Why? Because they want to feel better about themselves. Because they've lost their identity. Pretentiousness, pretending to be somebody that you're not. Having this awe of holiness and then not living that. Or living with contempt where you hate other people. Or malice where you desire to hurt other people. Because when you hurt others, you feel better about yourself. These are all what we call lack of identity. And it causes inferiority. It causes exaggerated, erratic, incorrect responses to everyday situations in life. And we are hurting people, hurting each other in this whole cycle of the identity crisis. And humanity has no answer for this because you can't go back and erase the past. You can't go back and fix things. It's like me. My life just went from bad to worse. Then I started stealing. Somehow when I stole, when I broke in, when I stole stuff, I felt better. I don't know why, but it, it gave me a little bit of a happy hormone release in my brain and I felt better. When I used drugs, I felt better for a minute or two. But my life was a mess and I had lost my identity. Identity is defined in the dictionary as traits, attitudes, self-knowledge, cognitive structures, in other words, frame of references, past, present, future, self-preservation, social roles, relationships, group affiliations. We have identity problems all over society. When you go to the prison system, when you go to the drug community, when you go to the delinquent or so-called delinquent child communities, you will find at the heart of the problem is the lack of identity. And this is the very thing that the God of this world, Satan, is currently using to destroy. Because in the church, we've lost our identity in theological discouragement and theological confusion. 
We don't know who God is. We don't know what God wants. We don't know who we are. I mean, if I look at my image of God growing up in the traditional church, I thought God was angry. I thought God was somebody sitting there with a stick waiting to hit me. I thought God hated me because I was so sinful. And I kept on with this erratic behaviors in my life. So it was this cycle from, I couldn't run to God because if I ran to God, God would be the one actually hitting me over the head. You can imagine the amount of turmoil and confusion and you can also think why I wanted to take my own life. At nine years old, I had my first suicide attempt. I wanted to kill myself. I was so unhappy inside of my own skin. I was battling with this thing of being a human being on this planet. Maybe as you're listening or watching today, you are in an identity crisis. You find yourself reacting. You find yourself angry. You find yourself uh, always frustrated and irritated with people. You find that this is part of your normal everyday life. You've made a lot of debt. You've bought a lot of things. You've worked yourself to the bone, neglecting everything that's really important, functioning just in the urgent things of life because of the fact that you've lost your identity. You don't know who you are. Even in the church, you're trying to do everything for everybody all the time, trying to be the shining knight in armor all the time. But it's not authentic. It's not truthful. And your behaviors, your religious behaviors even, is not coming from a paradigm of certainty of who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. One of the greatest challenges is accepting yourself as a son or a daughter of the Most High God. Accepting Jesus is a great thing because Jesus is good. We know He's good. We know He's God. We know He died on the cross for our sins. We know He lived the sinless and the perfect life. But what about you and what about me? How do we see ourselves after we've received Jesus as Lord and Savior? And that's why I'm saying the church is full of people with inferiority complexes trying to prove themselves every week, even in the midweek services, the services, the prayer meetings. They're trying to prove themselves because of lack of identity. They're having all these delinquent behaviors. Now let me take this from a biblical perspective and let me give you a biblical foundation of identity in Christ. What does the Bible say about you and about me? Does the Bible say that we are perfect? No. Does the Bible say that we can continue to live in sin as we want to? No. But the Bible says that we are now found in Christ Jesus, not having a righteousness of our own, which comes from the flesh, from the outward performance of human standards. No, we have this righteousness which is imputed. In other words, it's given unto us. In fact, when we were redeemed in Galatians 4, 5 and 6, you will read, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. So when we were redeemed, when we were purchased back, redemption means to be bought back from slavery of sin, of depravity. We were brought back for the purpose to step into sonship. This is the purpose. Salvation's purpose is not just to be born again and a Christian. It's to become a son in the fullness of the term. Now this is something that's not always taught well in church because we don't always understand what does it mean to become a son. And how do we get there? How do we get to that point of losing our inferiorities? Stopping the process of trying to prove ourselves over and over again. Being defensive and offensive all the time. Living abrasively with those around us. How can we integrate into the kingdom of God, into the body of Christ, becoming the members of the body of Christ, functioning as members in unison under the head Jesus Christ. Stop fighting, stop quarreling. This is all coming from a lack of identity. Because when we have the surety of who we are in Christ, we stop trying to prove ourselves. Even when people attack us, we don't have to defend ourselves because we have confidence, not in us, but in Christ. We have been redeemed. Our righteousness is imputed. We are now found in Christ. And we've been redeemed, Galatians 4, 5, 6 says, that we might receive the adoption of sonship. So we have to receive sonship, not just salvation, but we have to receive it. Have you received this? 
Do you understand this? Is this even on your Christian agenda to become a son or a daughter of the Most High God? At the end of this message, I'm going to give you what the Bible says about this. And it's so exciting to see the image that we now have in Christ. When we look in the Word, the mirror of the Word, we see this image that we now have in Christ, which is already ours by faith. We receive it. We don't work for it. We don't live up to it. It starts manifesting when the transformation takes place inside of us and we understand it in the sense of receiving it. Well, if we get to the next scripture, John 1, 12 and 13 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave power. Dunamis. He gave power. He's given you the power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name. I don't know if you've seen these scriptures in the context that I'm giving them to you today. But this says that you have the power. If you've received him as Lord and Savior. You know of a date and a time that you've made Jesus King of Kings and Lord of Lords in your life. It says here that you now have the power to become a son of God. It doesn't say that you are automatically a son of God, it says that you have the power. Like Galatians says, you must receive the adoption. You must believe and receive, 1 John 12 says. How do we receive this? Galatians 3.26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith. You have to believe it. What do you believe about yourself? Do you still believe what your parents told you? What your teachers told you? What your husband or your wife told you? Your ex-husband or your ex-wife told you? Your boyfriend or your girlfriend told you? Or your friends told you? At school, you're a loser. You're just old pity or old Kursi or Sunny or Yanni. You will never amount to anything. Do you still believe that? Is that still the narrative that you believe? Stepping into sonship is stepping into fullness. But we step into this through faith. When I preach the word today and you are hearing this, it's supposed to stir you in faith. The scriptures I'm going to be sharing with you at the end of this program today is supposed to stir you in faith. By the time I've read some of those scriptures, you are supposed to stand up in faith and acquire by faith, what God has provided by grace, you're supposed to take it today. How does this work? Romans 8.14 tells us, For all who are led by the Spirit, not led by their past, not led by their inferiority complex, not led by their defensive nature or their agitation, not led by other people, but led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. It says that an intimate connection is required. A hearing ear, my sheep hear my voice. A hearing ear is required to step into sonship. The idea of sonship is the idea of security and surety. It's your father. It's not God far off. It's not God that you fear. It's God that you love. It's God, not God that you wonder about. It's God that you know, that you intimately have a relationship with. This is only found in the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we surrender our lives to the Spirit of God, listening to the voice of the Spirit, obeying the voice of the Spirit. We are led into the divine knowledge, the revelation knowledge of sonship. And in sonship is authority and surety because when there is surety, when there is confidence, when there is boldness, there is authority. When there is insecurity, there is a lack of authority. There is confusion. There is fear. But where there is faith and surety, there the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit functions. I had to find this out as I was growing. When I came to Christ with this lack of identity, with all these inferiority complexes, I was manifesting 
all the time. And every time I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, Richard, you're better than this. You didn't have to kick that door down. You didn't have to swear at that person. You didn't have to throw something at that person. You didn't have to get so angry at that person that was doing this or saying this behind your back. If you know who you are in Christ and you know God is your Father, why are you trying to defend yourself or prove yourself every single day? Why has your life become a stage where you believe the world is watching what you're achieving? Why are you making debt and buying things and wearing clothes and piercings and tattoos and all sorts of things because you want to impress other people or you want to create and generate an image because of the lack of the inner image, you want to create an outer image. I had to learn this the hard way every time I failed and the Holy Spirit came to me and said, you were wrong, Richard. Repent and follow the voice of your Father. And as I obeyed, this process started, I knew, by revelation knowledge, I was a son. But by obedience and listening, I had to step into it progressively. I'm sure many of you listening now can identify. You can identify with what I'm saying, with exaggerated anger, with fear. With fear of humans or fear of man. Wondering what people are thinking about me. Getting up on stage or having to speak in front of people or ministering, you, you get up with fear of man, wondering, what will man think? Are people are going to like my message? What are they going to say afterwards? Will people follow me? Will they like me? Will they share me? That is my primary concern. How can I be popular? How can I be accepted? Why? Because I feel rejected. Face the facts today as you're hearing this message and allow the Holy Spirit to convict you. Not condemn you, convict you so that you can step into the peace that transcends understanding that is only found in sonship. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. You don't have to satisfy anybody's desires and needs. You only answer to your master and to your king. Jesus Christ and God, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit as you allow the Holy Spirit to transform you. But you have to take it by faith today. You have to take it by faith. This is something you can't just hear and say, oh, very nice little message, interesting. No, you have to say, this is a battle plan for me to transform my life as I'm hearing this message of sonship. I am making a decision today that things in my life are never going to be the same again. Never. I'm not going to allow the devil to steal, kill and destroy anymore using my inferiorities, using my insecurities, using my lack of knowledge, using my lack of identity, I'm not going to allow the devil to steal, kill and destroy. I'm stopping the cycle right now. Only you can stop it. Your life will carry on exactly like it's been carrying on and even it will go worse because the devil is coming to steal, kill and destroy unless you make a decision. Today I can tell you that I am a son of God. Some people might say, you're not a good person. I'm not saying I'm a good person. I'm saying I'm serving a good God. I'm saying that I am in a transformation process. Some people might say, Richard, you've made mistakes. We know you personally. Yes, I have made mistakes. But every time I make a mistake, when I fall, I fall on my knees. And I say, God, I understand that you are busy with me, transforming me. From glory to glory. I wanted to share something that I heard last night that really touched my heart. There's this thing in the church about women and men. When it comes to identity, if you were born a woman in Jesus' time and in certain cultures, you would be inferior. Even today in society, men still see women 
as inferior. I believe that women have a greater challenge to find their identity in Christ because even when we talk about sonship, there's an exclusion of the female gender. It feels like we're talking about a man and not a woman. This isn't what the Bible means. Galatians 3.26 says, For you are all sons of God through faith, all of us, in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, it says, For as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It says we have to put on Christ. Not put on our TVs, not put on our internet, put on Christ. And what does it say in verse 28? It says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. This Hebrew scholar was talking in a message and said that the first description in the Hebrew language of woman as a helper means in Hebrew somebody who is critical to help. I know from the teachings of Paul when he writes to the churches directly and he instructs them to quiet the women down who were taking over the church, we sometimes extract those teachings in isolation with, with improper hermeneutical principles and poor exegesis. We extract those and we create an inferiority. And sometimes we even say, how can Paul say in Galatians that there's no male, no female, but then he, he instructs the female certain things in certain of the letters. Those letters were addressed to them. It was written to them, but for us. So we extract from those letters what is for us. But it was written to them as instructional because of situational context in the church right then. That is where the male-female gender problem comes in. And there are many more other problems that we can talk about that we see here in Galatians 3. Even if we talk about Jew and Greek, we can talk about racial problems, ethical problems, cultural problems, male-female problems. But he says, no, you are all one. When we talk about slave and freeman, we can talk about the rich and the poor. The advantaged and the disadvantaged. And we can say, no, we are all one. So this lady says this word. What really gives the explanation to this word is that this word is also used. The same Hebrew word is used when God refers to himself as Israel's helper. Now we would never see God as inferior to Israel, no. But it's the same word. So when the Bible talks about woman or female as an helper, it's not saying an inferior person or inferior being. It is saying an essential and critical help. You can see how confused we are even in the church of Jesus Christ. I had a guy phone me once after a service. I was playing a a woman's message, a, a lady preacher's message, and he said, I will never listen to your program again because there was a woman ministering. I said to, to the man, I said, listen, you don't ever have to listen to my program again and then stop reading your Bible. And then he started negotiating and reasoning with me from the Bible. And I said, listen, do a proper study of God's word in context. Look at the cultural context. Look at the situational context. Look at the entire book, the chapter, the verse, and do proper exegesis using biblical hermeneutics and then you come and talk to me about your personal persuasion and you will see that you are totally wrong discriminating and even saying that you are going to reject the gift of God functioning in a person because she might be known as a woman no Paul says in Galatians 3 he says there's no slave there's no freeman he says there's no Jew, there's no Greek. And he says there's no man, there's no woman. He says we are all Abram's seed and we are heirs according to the promise. He says that we are all sons of God through faith. Can you receive that today? Can you receive that today? Let me end off with Identity scriptures that I found in the Bible. What the Bible says about you. 
and what the Bible says about me. You can write these down and you can meditate upon God's word until it becomes saturated in your inner being and where this revelation starts becoming a realization, a reality in your life. Romans 15, 7 says you are accepted. John 15, 16 says you are actually chosen. Galatians 4, 7 says you are free. Even if your natural man is not free, you are already free in, in faith. You are free in faith. 1 John 1, 9 says you are forgiven. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says you are a new person. John 1.12 says you are a child of God, a son of God. We learn in Genesis 1.27 that we are made in the image of God. 1 Corinthians 3.23 says you belong to Jesus. Romans 6.4 says Jesus offers you a new life. Philippians 3.20 says you are a heavenly citizen. 1 Peter 1.5 says you are protected by God. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 tells us that we are part of something very important. In Romans 8, 38 to 39, we can read that God loves us no matter what and nothing can ever separate us from His love. Psalm 139, verse 13 to 16 says, You are God's special creation. Isaiah 43, 4 says, You are precious to God. We just read in Galatians 3.13 now that you are rescued by God. Jeremiah 29.11 says that God has a plan for your life. 1 John 5.14-15 says God listens to you. Philippians 4.13 says God gives you strength. And Romans 8.17 says you are heirs of God. I can carry on. The whole day there are so many promises. In Psalm 23 verse 1 to 3. We read that God is taking care of us. In John 15 11, We read that Jesus gives us true joy. True joy. True peace. Ephesians 1 3 tells us that we are blessed. Galatians 2 20 says Jesus gave himself for us so that we can receive this inheritance. And if nobody else understands you in Psalm 139, 1, it says God understands you. Exodus 19, 5, God says, You are my treasured people. God treasures you. And Galatians 2, 10 says that you are complete in Christ. In Christ, you find your true identity in Christ you find your true reality in Christ you find your true prosperity in Christ you find your true victory in Jesus name Amen